Good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to lecture 18. Today, we'll be talking about some of the latest and greatest developments in neural NLP, where we've come and where we're headed. Uh, Chris, just to be sure, uh, are, are my presenter notes visible from this, or is it fine? Yeah, you're visible. OK, uh, but not my presenter notes, right? Correct. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so just as a reminder, note that your guest lecture reactions are due tomorrow at 11.59 PM. A uh, great job with the project milestone reports. You sh should have received feedback now. If not, contact the course staff. I think uh, you know, we had some last minute issues, uh, but if that's not resolved, please contact us. Um, uh, finally, the project reports are due very soon uh, on the March 16th, which is next week. There's one question on Ed about uh, the leaderboard. And uh, the last day to submit on the leaderboard is March 19th uh, as well. OK, so for today, we'll start by talking about extremely large language models and GPT-3 uh, that have recently gained a lot of popularity. Uh, we'll then take a closer look at compositionality and generalization of these neural models. Um, while transformer models like BERT and GPT have really high performance on all benchmarks, they still fail in really surprising ways when deployed. How can we strengthen our understanding of evaluating these models so they more closely reflect task performance uh, in, in the real world? And then we end by talking about how we can move beyond this really limited paradigm of teaching models language only through text and look at language grounding. Finally, I'll give some practical tips on how to move forward in your neural NLP research. And this will include some uh, practical tips for the final project as well. Okay, so uh, you know, this, this beam really kind of captures uh, you know, what's been going on in the field really. And it's, it's just that our ability to harness unlabeled data has vastly increased over the last few years. And this has been made possible due to advances in not just hardware, but also systems and our understanding of like self-supervised uh, training so we can use like lots and lots of ungiven data. Um, so based on this, here's a general representation learning recipe that just works for you know, all basically most modalities. So the, the recipe is, uh, is, is basically as follows. So convert your data, if it's images converted uh, or like it, it's not, uh, it, uh, it's, it's really modality agnostic. So you take your data, if it's images, text, or videos, and you convert it into a sequence of integers. And then step two, you define a loss function to maximize data likelihood or create a denoising autoencoder loss. Finally, in step three, train on lots and lots of data. Um, certain properties emerge only when we scale up model size. And this is really the surprising fact about scale. So to give some examples of this recipe in action, Here's GPT-3, which can learn to do a really non-trivial classification problem with just two demonstrations. And we'll talk more about this soon. Um, another example, as we saw in lecture 14, is T5, which does really effective closed book QA by storing knowledge in its parameters. Uh, finally, just so I cover another modality, here's a recent uh, text to image uh, generation model with really impressive zero shot generalization. Okay, so now let's talk about GPT-3. So how big really are these models? Uh, this table kind of presents some numbers to put things in, in, in perspective. Um, so, uh, so we have a collection of models starting with medium sized LSTMs, which was sort of a staple in pre-2016 NLP, all the way to humans who have 100 trillion synapses. And somewhere in the middle, we have GPT-2 with over a billion parameters and GPT-3 with over 150 billion parameters. Uh, and this exceeds the number of synaptic connections in a honeybee brain. So obviously anyone with little knowledge of neuroscience uh, knows that this is not an apples to oranges comparison, uh, th that this is an apples to oranges comparison. But the point here is that the scale of these models is really starting to reach astronomical numbers. Um, so here are some facts about GPT-3. Uh, for one, it's a large transformer with 96 layers. Um, it has more or less the same architecture as GPT-2, with the exception that to scale up attention computation, uh, it uses these locally banded sparse attention patterns 
And I really encourage you to look at the paper to understand the details. The reason we mentioned this here is because it kind of highlights that scaling up is simply not just changing hyperparameters, as many might believe, and it involves really non-trivial engineering and algorithms to make computations efficient. Finally, all of this is trained on 500 billion tokens taken from the Common Crawl, or the Toronto Books Corpus, Wikipedia. So what's new about GPT-3? Right. So let's, let's look at uh, some of the results on the paper first. Uh, so obviously it does better on language modeling and text completion problems. Uh, as we can see uh, from this table, it does better than GPT-2 at language modeling on the pen tree bank, as well as better on story completion on the story completion data set called Lambada. Uh, to give a flavor of what's to come, uh, let's take a closer look at this Lambada story completion data set. So the task here is that we're given a short story and we are supposed to fill in the last word. Um, satisfying the constraints uh, of the problem can be hard for a language model, which could generate a multi-word completion. But with GPT-3, the really new thing is that we can just give a few examples as prompts and sort of communicate a task specification to the model. And now GPT-3 knows how the completion must be a single word. This is a very, very powerful paradigm. And we give some more examples of this in-context learning in a couple more slides. So apart from language modeling, it's really good at, at these knowledge intensive tasks like uh, closed book QA, as well as reading comprehension. And here we observe that scaling up parameters results in a massive improvement in performance. So now let's talk about in-context learning. Uh, GPT-3 demonstrates some level of fast adaptation to completely new tasks. This happens via what's called in-context learning. Uh, as shown in the figure, the model training can be characterized as having an outer loop that learns a set of parameters that makes the learning of the inner loop as efficient as possible. And with this sort of framework in mind, we can really see how a good language model can also serve as a good few shot learner. So in this segment, we will have some fun with GPT-3 and look at some demonstrations of this in-context learning. Um, so uh, to, to start off here is an example where someone's trying to create an application that converts language a language description uh, to bash one liners. And the first three examples are prompts followed by generated examples from GPT-3. Uh, so it gets a list of running processes, right? This one's easy, probably just involves looking at your hash table. Some of the more challenging ones that involve copying over, um, you know, some uh, spans from the text, like the SCP examples is kind of interesting, as well as the harder one to parse grep. Uh, the SCP example comes up a lot uh, during office hours, so GPT-3 knows how to do that. Here's a somewhat more challenging one where the model is given a description of a database in natural language, and it starts to emulate that behavior. So the text in bold is sort of the prompt given to the model. The prompt includes somewhat of a functional, uh, functional specification of what a database is. So it says that the database begins knowing nothing, the database knows everything that's added to it. The database does not know anything else. And when you ask a question to the database, if the answer is there in the database, the database must return the answer. Otherwise it should say it does not know the answer. So this is very new and very powerful. Um, and you know, the prompt also includes some example usages. So when you ask two plus two, the database does not know. When you ask the capital of France, the database does not know. And then you add in a fact that Tom is 20 years old to the database. And now you can start asking it questions like, where does Tom live? And as expected, it says that the database does not know. But now if you ask it, what's Tom's age? Uh, the database says that Tom is 20 years old. And if you ask, what's my age? The database says basically that it does not know because that's not been added. So this is really powerful. Um, here's another one. Uh, now, uh, in this example, the model is asked to blend concepts together. And so there's a definition of what does it mean to blend concepts. So if you take airplane and car, you can blend that to give flying car. Um, that's essentially like, you know, there's a Wikipedia definition of what concept blending, it, uh, concept blending is along with some examples. And now let's look at, uh, you know, some, some, some prompts followed by what GPT-3 answers. So the first one is uh, straightforward, two dimensional space uh, blended with 3D space gives 2.5 dimensional space. The one that is somewhat interesting is old and new gives recycled. Um, uh, then uh, triangle and square gives trapezoid. That's also interesting. Uh, the one that's like really non-trivial is 
uh, geology plus neurology used to sediment neurology and I had no idea what this was. It's apparently correct. Um, so clearly it, it, it's able to do these very flexible things just from a just from prompt. So here's another you know, class of examples that GPT-3 uh, you know, gets somewhat right. And these are uh, these copycat analogy problems uh, which have been really well studied in cognitive science. Uh, and the way it works is that I'm going to give you some examples and then ask you to, uh, you know, induce a function from these examples and apply it to new, apply it to like new, new queries. So if ABC changes to ABD, what does PQR change to? Well, PQR must change to PQS because the function we've learned is that the last letter must be incremented by one. And, and, and this function, uh, humans can now apply to examples of like, you know, varying types. So like, uh, P repeated twice, Q repeated twice, R repeated twice, must change to P repeated twice, Q repeated twice, and S repeated twice. Um, and it seems like GPT-3 is able to get them right, uh, more or less. But uh, the problem is that if you, uh, if you ask it to generalize to, uh, you know, examples that have increasing number of rep repetitions than were seen in the prompt, it's not able to do that. So in, in this situation, uh, you ask it to you know, um, make an analogy where um, the, the, the letters are repeated four times and it's never seen that before and it doesn't know what to do. And so it, it gets all of these wrong. So, you know, there's a point to be made here about uh, just like maybe these prompts are not enough to convey, uh, you know, the function the model should be learning and maybe even more examples it can learn it. But the point is that it, it probably doesn't, um, it, probably, it, it probably does not have the same kinds of generalization that humans have. And that brings us to sort of the limitations of, of these models and some, some open questions. So just looking at the paper and uh, you know, parsing through the results, it seems like the model is bad at logical, math, logical and mathematical reasoning and anything that involves doing multiple steps uh, of reasoning. And that explains why it's bad at arithmetic, why it's bad at word problems, why it's not great at analogy making, and even like traditional textual entailment data sets that seem to require logical reasoning like RTE. So second most subtle point is that it's unclear how we can uh, make permanent updates to the model. Like maybe if I want to teach a model a new concept, that's possible to do it uh, while I'm interacting with the system. But once the interaction is over, it kind of restarts and does not have a notion of knowledge. And it's not that this is something that the model cannot do in principle, but uh, just something that's not really been explored. Um, it doesn't seem to exhibit human-like generalization, which is often called systematicity. And I'll talk a lot more about that. And finally, language is situated and GPT-3 is just learning from text and there's no exposure to other modalities, there's no interaction. So maybe the aspects of meaning that it acquires are like somewhat limited and maybe we should explore how we can bring in other modalities. So we'll talk a lot more about uh, these last, uh, last two limitations the rest of the lecture. Uh, but maybe I can pause for some questions now if, if there are any. Um, I don't think there's a big outstanding question, but I mean, I think some people aren't really clear on, you know, few shot setting and prompting versus learning. And I think it might actually be good to explain that a bit more. Okay, yeah, so um, so maybe let's, let me pick a simple example. Um, let me pick this example here. So uh, prompting just means that, so GPT-3, like if you go back to first principles, right? GPT-3 is basically just a language model. And what that means is uh, given a context, it'll tell you what's the probability of, of the next word, right? So if I give it a context uh, W1 through WK, uh, GPT-3 will tell me what's the probability of uh, WK uh, plus one for you know, opens the vocabulary. So that's, that's what a language model is. Uh, a prompt is essentially a context that gets prepended before GPT-3 can start uh, generating. And what's happening with in-context learning is that the uh, the, the context that you append, uh, that, that you, that you prepend to GPT-3 are basically X, Y examples. Um, so that's, that's the prompt. And the reason why it's also, uh, it, it's equivalent to few short learning is because 
you prepend a small number of x, y examples. So in this case, if I just prepend this, uh, this one example that's highlighted in purple, then that's uh, essentially one shot learning because I just give it a single example as context. And now like given, uh, you know, given this query, which is also appended to, to the model, it has to make a prediction. So, um, uh, so the input output format is the same as how a few shot learner uh, would receive. But since it's a language model, the training data set is essentially presented as, as a context. So someone is still asking, can you be more specific about the in-context learning setups? What is the task? Right, so, um, so let's see, maybe I can go to, um, Yeah, so maybe I can go to this slide. So the task is just that I'm, uh, it's a language model. So it gets a context, which is just a sequence of tokens. And the task is just to, you know, uh, uh, so you have a sequence of tokens and then the model has to generate given a, a sequence of tokens. And the way you can convert that into an actual machine learning classification problem is that uh, so for uh, this example, maybe you give it five plus eight equals 13, uh, seven plus two equals nine, and then one plus zero equals. And now GPT-3 can fill in uh, you know, a number there. And so that's how you convert it into a classification problem. The context here would be these two examples of, uh, of arithmetic, like five plus eight equals 13 and seven plus two equals nine. And then the query is one plus zero equals. And then the model, since it's just a language model, has to fill in one plus zero equals question mark. So it fills in something that doesn't have to fill in numbers. It could fill in anything. And, but if it fills in a one, uh, you know, it, it does the right job. Uh, so that's how you can take like a language model and do few shot learning with it. I'll keep on these questions. How is in-context learning different from transfer learning? So I, I guess the like uh, in 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 context learning. I mean, you can think of in context learning as being a kind of transfer learning, but like transfer learning does not specify the mechanism through which the transfer is going to happen. With in context learning, the mechanism is that uh, the training examples are sort of appended to the model, which is a language model, just uh, you know uh, in order. So let's say you have x, y, x1, y1, x2, y2, and these are just appended directly to the model. And now it makes prediction on you know, some, query, uh, some, some queries that are drawn from this data set. So yes, it is, uh, it is a subcategory of transfer learning, but transfer learning does not specify um, exactly how this transfer learning is achieved. But in-context learning is very specific and says that for language models, you can essentially concatenate the training data set and then present that to the language model. I think people still aren't sufficiently clear on what is or isn't happening with learning and prompting. So, you know, another question is, so in context learning still needs fine tuning question mark. We need to train GPT-3 to do in context learning question so, mark. Right, so, um, so there are two parts to this question, right? So, uh, so the answer is yes and no. So of course uh, the, the, the model is a language model, so it needs to be trained. So you start with some random parameters and you need to train them, but the model is trained as a language model, right? And once the model is trained, you can now use it uh, to do transfer learning. And the model parameters in, in context learning are fixed. You do not update the model parameters. All you do is that you give it these uh, you know, small training set to the model, which is just appended to the model as context. And now the model can start generating from that point on. So in this example, if five plus eight equals 13 and seven plus two equals nine are two X, Y examples. In, in, in uh, vanilla transfer learning, what you would do is that you would take some gradient steps, update your model parameters, and then make a prediction on one plus zero equals what? Right? But with in-context learning, all you're doing is you just concatenate uh, five plus eight equals 13 and seven plus two equals nine to the model's context window, and then make it uh, predict 
what one plus zero should be equal to. Yeah. Maybe we should end for now with one other bigger qu picture question, which is, do you know of any research combining these models with reinforcement learning for the more complicated reasoning tasks? So that is an excellent question. Uh, there is some recent work on kind of trying to align um, language models with human preferences where yes, there is like, uh, you know, some amount of fine tuning with reinforcement learning based on like these preferences from humans. So maybe you want to do a summer, uh, you want to do a summarization problem with GPT-3 and the model produces multiple summaries. And uh, for each summary, maybe you have a reward uh, that is essentially a human preference. Like maybe I want to include some facts and I don't want to include, you know, some other uh, non-important facts. And so I can construct a reward out of that and I can fine tune the parameters of my language model, uh, basically using uh, reinforcement learning based on this reward, which is essentially human preferences. Uh, so there's some very recent work that tries to do this, but I'm not sure, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not aware of any work that tries to use reinforcement learning to teach a reasoning uh, to these models, but I, I think it's a interesting future direction to explore. Maybe you should go on at this point. Okay. Okay, so we'll talk a bit more about these last two points. Uh, so systematicity and uh, language grounding. Um, so just to start off, like how do you define systematicity? So really the definition is that there is a definite and predictable pattern among the sentences that native speakers of a language understand. And so there's a systematic pattern among uh, the sentences that we understand. What that means is, let's say there's a sentence like John loves Mary, right? And if a native speaker understands the sentence, then they should also be able to understand the sentence, Mary loves John. Um, and closely related to this idea of systematicity is the principle of compositionality. And for now, I'm going to uh, you know, ignore the definition by Montague and just look at the rough definition and then we can come back to this other like more concrete definition. The rough definition is essentially that the meaning of an expression is a function of the meaning of its parts. So that brings us to the question, are human languages really composition? And here are some examples that, you know, make us think that maybe uh, yes. So like, if you look at uh, what, what is the meaning of the noun phrase brown cow, so it is composed of the meaning of the uh, adjective brown and, and the noun cow. Um, so all things that are brown and all things that are cow take the intersection and get brown cows. Similarly, red rabbits, so all things that are red, all things that are rabbit, combine them, get red rabbits. And then kick the ball, this word phrase can be understood as you have some agent that's you know, performing a, 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 like a kicking operation on the ball. Uh, but it's, this is not always the case that uh, you can like, get at the meaning of the whole by uh, combining meanings of parts. So here we have some counter examples that people often use. So like red herring does not mean all things that are red and all things that are herring. And kick the bucket definitely does not mean that there's an agent that's kicking the bucket. So uh, while these examples like are, su are supposed to be provocative, like we think that language is like mostly compositional. There's lots of exceptions, but for, for vast majority of sentences that we've never heard before, we're able to understand what they mean by piecing together uh, the words that the sentence is composed of. And so what that means is that maybe compositionality of representation is a helpful prior that could lead to systematicity in behavior. Um, and that brings us to the questions that we ask in the segment, are neural representations compositional? And the second question is, if so, do they generalize systematically? Um, so how do you even uh, measure if representations that a neural network learns exhibit compositionality. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let's go back to this definition from Montague, which says that compositionality is about the existence of a homomorphism from syntax to semantics. Um, and to look at that, we have this uh, example, which is Lisa does not skateboard. And we have a syntax tree uh, corresponding to this example. And the meaning of the sentence can be composed in uh, uh, according to uh, according to the structure that's decided by the syntax. So meaning of Lisa does not skateboard is a function of the meaning of Lisa and does not skateboard. 
the meaning of does not skateboard is a function of does and not skateboard. The meaning of not skateboard is a function of not and skateboard. So that's good. Um, and so this gives us one way of formalizing how we can measure compositionality in neural representations. And so compositionality of representations could be thought of as how well the representation approximates an explicitly homomorphic, uh, homomorphic function learned in a learned representation space. So what we're going to do is essentially measure if we were to construct a neural network that uh, whose computations are based exactly according to these parse trees, how far are the representations of our learned model from this explicitly compositional uh, representation? And that'll give us some understanding of how compositional the neural networks representations really are. Uh, so to unpack that a little bit, uh, instead of having, um, yeah, so, so instead of having uh, denotations, we have uh, representations uh, uh, in the node. Uh, and to like kind of be more concrete about that, uh, we first start by choosing a distance function that tells us how far away two representations are. And then we also need a way to compose together two constituents to give us uh, sort of the, the meaning of, of, of the whole. And, but once we have that, we can start by, uh, we can create like an explicitly compositional function, right? So what we do is um, we have these, uh, we have these uh, representations at the leaves that are initialized randomly and the composition function that's also initialized randomly and then a forward pass according to this syntax is used to compute the representation of Lisa does not skateboard. And now once you have this representation, you can create a loss function. And this loss function measures how far are the representations of my neural network from this second sort of proxy neural network that I've created. And then I can uh, basically optimize both the composition function and the embeddings of the leaves and then once the optimization is finished, I can measure how far was the representation from my, of my neural net from this explicitly compositional network on a held out set. And that then tells me whether the representation that my neural net learned were actually compositional or not. So uh, to see how well this works, let's look at a plot. And um, this is relatively uh, complex, but uh, just to unpack this a little bit, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it plots uh, the mutual information between uh, the input that uh, the neural network receives versus the representation against this tree reconstruction error that, that we were talking about. And to give some more background about what's to come, uh, there is a theory of uh, the, uh, which is called the information bottleneck theory, which says that uh, as a neural network trains, uh, it first tries to maximize the mutual information between the representation and the input in an attempt to memorize the entire data set. And that is called, uh, a, that is a memorization phase. And then once memorization is done, there is a learning or a compression phase where uh, this mutual information starts to decrease. And the model is essentially trying to compress the data or consolidate the knowledge in the data into its parameters. And what we are seeing here is that as a model learns, which is characterized by decreasing mutual information, we see that the representations themselves are becoming more and more compositional. And overall, we observe that learning is correlated with increased compositionality as measured by the tree reconstruction error. So that's really encouraging. So uh, now that we have a method of measuring compositionality, uh, of representations in these neural nets. Uh, how do we you know, start to create benchmarks uh, you know, that, that see if they are generalizing systematically or not? So to do that, uh, here's a method for taking any data set and splitting it into a train test split uh, that explicitly tests for this kind of generalization. So uh, to do that, we uh, use this principle called maximizing the compound divergence. And to illustrate how this principle works, uh, we uh, look at this toy example. So in this toy example, we have a training data set uh, that consists of just two examples and test data set of just two examples. Um, the atoms are defined as sort of the primitive elements. Uh, so entity words, predicates, question types, 
So, you know, in, in this toy example, Goldfinger, Christopher Nolan, these are all sort of the primitive elements and the compounds are compositions of these primitive elements. So who directed entity would be the composition of the question type, did X predicate Y and, and the predicate direct. So here's a basic machinery for producing compositionally challenging splits. So uh, let's start by introducing two distributions. The first distribution is the normalized frequency distribution of the atoms. So given any data set, if we know what the notion of atoms are, we can uh, basically compute the frequency of all of the atoms and then normalize that by the total count. And that's going to give us um, one, one distribution. And we can repeat the same thing for the compounds. And that will give us a second uh, frequency distribution. So uh, note that these are just two probability distributions. And once we have these two distributions, we can essentially define the atom and compound divergence simply as uh, this quantity here. And uh, where uh, there is the churn of coefficient between two categorical distributions, the churn of coefficient basic, basically measures uh, how far two categorical distributions are. So just to get a bit more intuition about this, uh, if we set P to Q, then the churn of coefficient is one, which means these, uh, these representations are like maximally similar. And then if P is non-zero everywhere, Q is zero, um, or, 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 if, or if P is zero in all the places where Q is zero, then the churn of coefficient is exactly, uh, is, is exactly zero, which means that this, these two distributions are maximally far away. And uh, the overall goal by uh, describing uh, this objective is that uh, this loss objective is just that we're going to maximize the compound divergence and minimize the atom divergence. And so what is the intuition behind doing such a thing? So what we want is to ensure that the unigram distribution uh, in some sense is constant between the train and test split so that it's, uh, so, so that the model does not encounter any new words. But we want the compound divergence to be uh, very high, which means that these same words that the model has seen many times must appear in new combinations, which means that we are testing for systematicity. And so if you do, uh, if, if you follow this procedure for a semantic passing data set, let's say, what we see uh, is that as you increase the scale, we see that this model just does better and better at a compositional generalization. But uh, just pulling out a quote from this, this paper, pre-training helps for compositional generalization, but doesn't fully solve it. And what that means is that maybe as you keep scaling up these models, you'll see better and better performance, or, or maybe it starts to saturate at some point. In any case, we should probably be thinking more about this problem uh, instead of just trying to brute force it. So now uh, this segment kind of tells us that the way we split a data set, you know, we, we can measure for like different kinds of, um, uh, you, we can measure like different behaviors of the model. And that tells us that maybe we should be like thinking more critically about how we're evaluating models in NLP in general. So, uh, you know, there has been a revolution basically over the last few years in the field where we're seeing all of these large transform models beat all of our benchmarks. At the same time, there's uh, you know, still not complete confidence that once we deploy these systems in the real world, they're going to you know, be like, they're going to maintain their performance. And so it's unclear if these gains are coming from spurious correlations or some real task understanding. And so how do we design benchmarks that accurately tell us how well this model is going to do in the real world? And so I'm going to give one example of works that try to do this. And uh, that's the idea of dynamic benchmarks. And uh, what, dynamic, what the, the idea of dynamic benchmarks is basically saying that instead of testing our models on static, uh, on static test sets, we should be evaluating them on an ever-changing dynamic benchmark. And there's uh, many recent examples of this. Uh, and, and the idea dates back to a 2017 workshop uh, at EMLP. And so the overall schematic looks something like this, that we start with a training data set and a test data set, which is the static, uh, static opera. We train a model on that. And then once the model is trained, uh, we deploy that and then have humans create new examples that the model fails to classify. And uh, crucially, we're looking for examples the model does not get tried, but humans have no issue figuring out. 
the answer to. So by playing this game of whack-a-mole where uh, you know, we uh, humans figure out what are uh, sort of the holes in the model's understanding, and then add that back into the training data, uh, retrain the model, deploy it again, have humans create new examples, we can essentially construct this never ending uh, you know, data set, this never ending test set, um, which can hopefully be a better proxy of estimating real world performance. Um, so, so this is some really cutting edge research. And one of the main challenges of you know, this class of works is that it's unclear how much this can scale up because uh, maybe after certain, after, after uh, multiple iterations of this whack-a-mole, uh, humans are just fundamentally limited by creativity. So figuring, figuring out how to uh, you know, deal with that is, is really an open problem. And current approaches just use examples from other data sets to you know, prompt humans to think more creatively. But maybe we can come up with like better, like more automated met uh, methods of doing this. So uh, this brings us to sort of the final segment. Um, or actually, let me stop for questions at this point and see if uh, people have questions. Here's a question. With dynamic benchmark, doesn't this mean that the model creator will also need to continually test slash evaluate the models on the new benchmarks, new data dash, new data, data sets. Uh, wait a second. Sorry. Um, yeah, so with, with dynamic benchmarks, yes, it's absolutely true that uh, you will have to continuously keep training your model. And that's just to ensure that, um, you know, the, the reason your model is not doing well on the test set doesn't have to do with like this domain mismatch. Um, and what we're really trying to do is like, you know, uh, measure how, like just come up with a better estimate of the model's performance on the overall task and just trying to get like more and more data. So yes, to answer, uh, to, to answer your question, yes, we need to keep like training the model again and again, but this can be automated. Okay, so uh, I'll move on to sort of uh, language grounding. So uh, in this final se uh, segment, I'll talk about how we can move beyond just training models uh, on, on text alone. Um, so many have articulated the need to use modalities other than text if we someday want to get at real language understanding. And uh, this has, you know, ever since we've had like these big language models, you know, this, there has been sort of a rekindling of this debate. And recently there was, uh, you know, multiple papers on this. And so at ACL last year, there was this paper that argues uh, through multiple thought experiments that it's actually impossible to acquire meaning from form alone, where meaning refers to the communicative intent of a speaker and form refers to text or speech signals. Um, a more moderate version of this was put forward by the second paper where they say that training on only web scale data kind of limits the world scope of models and kind of limits uh, the aspects of meanings that the model can actually acquire. Um, and so here's sort of a diagram that I've borrowed from the paper. And what they say is uh, the era where we were training models on like supervised data sets, uh, models were limited in world scope one. And now that we've moved on to exploiting like unlabeled data, we're now in world scope two, where models just have strictly more signal to get more aspects of meaning in. If you mix in additional modalities into this, so maybe you mix in videos and maybe you mix in images, then that uh, expands out the world scope of the model further. And now maybe it can acquire more aspects of meaning such that uh, now it knows that the uh, lexical item red refers to you know, red images maybe. And then if you go beyond that, you can have a model that is embodied and it's actually living in an environment where it can interact uh, with its data, conduct um, interventions and experiments. And then if you go out, uh, go even beyond that, you can have models that live in a social world where they can interact with other models because after all, the purpose of language is to communicate. And so if you can have like a social world where you know, um, uh, models can communicate with other models that kind of expands out 
uh, aspects of mean mean mean. And so GPT-3 is in world scope two. So there are a lot of open questions in this space. So given that there are all of these good arguments about how we need to move beyond text, what is the best way to do this at scale? Um, we know that you know, babies cannot learn language from uh, watching TV alone, for example. So there has to be some uh, interventions and there has to be interactions with the environment that need to happen. But at the same time, the question is how far can models go by just training on uh, you know, static data as long as we have additional modalities? especially when we combine this with scale. And if interactions with the environment are really necessary, how do we collect data and design systems that interact minimally or in a cost-effective way? And then finally, could pre-training on text still be useful if any of these other, uh, if any of these other, like um, any of these other research directions uh, become more sample efficient? So if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I highly encourage you to take CS224U, which is offered in the spring. They have like multiple lectures on just language grounding. Okay, so in this final segment, I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit more about how you can get involved with uh, you know, NLP and deep learning research and how, uh, you know, how you can make more progress. So uh, here are some general principles for how to make progress in, in real NLP research. So I think the most important thing is to just kind of read broadly, which means not just read the latest and greatest papers in archive, but also read like pre-2010 statistical NLP. Um, learn about the mathematical foundations of machine learning to understand how generalization works. So take cs 29 m Learn more about language which means taking uh, classes in the linguistics department. In particular, I would recommend Linguist 130A and also take CS224U. And finally, if you, wanted, uh, uh, if you wanted to take inspiration from how babies learn, then definitely read about child language acquisition literature. It's fascinating. Uh, finally, learn how to uh, learn your software tools, which uh, involves scripting tools, uh, version control, data wrangling, uh, learning how to visualize quickly with Jupyter Notebooks. And deep learning often involves um, you know, running multiple experiments with different hyperparameters and different ideas all in parallel. And sometimes it can get really hard to keep track of everything. So learn how to use experiment management tools like weights and biases. And uh, finally, uh, I'll talk about some really quick final project tips. Um, so first, I'll just start by saying that if your approach doesn't seem to be working, please do not panic. Uh, put assert statements everywhere and check if the computations that you're doing are correct. Use breakpoints extensively, and I'll talk a bit more about this. Uh, check if the loss function that you've implemented is correct. And one way of debugging that is to see that uh, the initial values are correct. So if you're doing a KV classification problem, then the initial loss should be a natural log of K. Uh, always, always, always start by creating a small training data set, which has like five to 10 examples and see if, you, if your model can completely overfit to that. If not, there's a problem with your training loop. Um, check for saturating activations and dead values. And often this can be fixed by, you know, like maybe there's some problems with the gradients or maybe there's some problems with the initialization, which brings me to the next point. Check your gradient values, see if they're too small, which means that maybe you should be using residual connections or LSTMs. Uh, or if they're too large, then you should use gradient clipping. In fact, always use gradient clipping. Um, overall, be methodical. If your approach doesn't work, come up with hypotheses of why this might be the case, design oracle experiments to debug it. Look at your data, look at uh, the errors that it's making, and just try to be systematic about everything. So um, I'll just say a little bit more about uh, breakpoints. Uh, so there's this great library called PDB. It's like GDB, but it's for Python. So that's why PDB. Um, to create to create a uh, breakpoint, just add the line import PDB PDB .set trace before the line you want to inspect. So earlier today, I was trying to play around with uh, with the transforms library. So uh, and I was trying to do question answering. So I have a really small training corpus. And the context is one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Uh, how he got into my pajamas, I don't know. And the question is, what did I shoot? 
And to do to solve this problem, I basically imported a tokenizer and a BERT model. Um, and I, you know, initialized my tokenizer, initialized my model, I tokenized my input. I set my model into the eval mode and I try to look at the output. But I get this error and I'm very sad. It's not clear what's causing this error. And so the best way to look at what's causing this error is to actually put a breakpoint. Um, so right after model.eval, I put a breakpoint because I know that that's where the problem is. So the problem is in line 21. So I put a breakpoint at line 21. And now once I put this breakpoint, I can just uh, run my uh, script again and it stops before executing line 21. And at this point, I can examine all of my variables. So I can look at the token as input because maybe that's where the problem is. And lo and behold, I see that it's actually a list. So it's a dictionary of lists, whereas models typically expect a dodge tensor. So now I know what the problem is. And that means I can quickly go ahead and fix it and everything just works. Uh, so this just shows that you should use breakpoints everywhere uh, if your code is not working and it can just like help you debug really quickly. Um, okay, so uh, finally, I'll say that if you want to get involved with NLP and deep learning research, and if you really like the final project, uh, we have the CLIPS program at, at Stanford, and this is uh, a, a way for undergrads, master's students, and PhDs who are interested in doing NLP research and want to get involved with the NLP group. Uh, so we highly encourage you to apply to CLIPS. Um, and so, yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, conclude, uh, conclude today's class by saying that, you know, we've made a lot of progress uh, in the last decade, and that's mostly due to you know, clever understanding of neural networks, data, hardware, and all of that combined with scale. Uh, we have some really amazing technologies that can do really exciting things, and we saw you know, some examples of that today. Um, in the short term, uh, I expect that we'll see more scaling uh, because it just seems to help. So perhaps even larger models, uh, but this is not trivial. So you know, I, I said that before, and I'll just say it again. Scaling requires really non-trivial engineering efforts and sometimes even you know, clever algorithms. And so we, there's a lot of interesting systems work to be done here. But in the long term, uh, we really need to be thinking more about these bigger problems of like systematicity, generalization. How can we make our models you know, uh, learn a new concept really quickly? So that's fast adaptation. Uh, and then we also need to you know, create benchmarks that we can actually trust. So if my model has some performance on some sentiment analysis data set, they're deployed in the real world that should be reflected in the number that I get from the benchmark. So we need to make progress uh, in, in the way we evaluate models. And then also figuring out a way to move beyond text in a more tractable way. Uh, this is also really essential. So yeah, that's, that's it. Good luck with your final projects. Uh, I can take more questions at this point. So I, I answered a, a question earlier that actually I think you, uh, could also opine on. Um, it was the question of whether you have a large model that's pre-trained on language, if it will actually help you in other domains, like you apply it to vision stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I guess uh, the answer is actually yeah. So like there was a paper that came out really, really recently, like just two days ago, that just takes, uh, I think it was GPT-2, I'm not sure. It's, it's like one large transformer model that's pre-trained on DEX and like other modalities. So they definitely apply to images. And I think they apply to like uh, math problems and some more modalities and show that it's actually really effective at like transfer. So if you pre-train on text and then you move to a different modality that helps. I think part of the reason for that is just that, you know, across modalities, there is a lot of autoregressive structure that is shared. Um, and I, I think one reason for that is that uh, language is really referring to the world around it. And so you might expect that uh, there is, you know, some, there is like some correspondence that's just beyond the autoregressive structure. So there's also works that show that uh, if you have just text only representations and image only representations, you can actually learn a simple linear classifier that can learn to align both of these representations. And all of these works are just showing that there's actually a lot more common between modalities than we thought in the beginning. Uh, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's possible to like, pre-train on text and then uh, fine tune on your uh, modality of interest and 
uh, it should probably be effective, um, of course, based on what the modality is. But yeah, for like images and videos, uh, it's certainly, certainly effective. More questions? Well, a couple of questions have turned up. Um, one is, what's the difference between CS224U and this class in terms of the topics covered and focus? Do you want to answer that one, Shakar, or should I have a go at answering it? Um, maybe you should answer this one. Okay, so next quarter, um, CS224U, Natural Language Understanding, is co-taught um, by Chris Potts um, and Bill McCartney. Um, so, you know, in essence, um, it's meant to be different that natural language understanding focuses on what its name is, um, sort of how to build computer systems that understand the sentences of natural language. Um, now, you know, in truth, the boundary is kind of complex because um, we do some natural language understanding in this class as well. And certainly for the people who are doing the default final project, um, question answering, well, that's absolutely a natural language understanding task. Um, but the distinction is meant to be that, you know, at least a lot of what we do in this class um, things like, you know, the assignment three dependency parser um, or building the machine translation system in um, assignment four, that they are in some sense natural language processing tasks where, you know, processing can mean anything, but commonly means you're doing useful, useful intelligent stuff with um, human language input, but you're not necessarily deeply understanding it. So there is some overlap in the classes. Um, if you do CS224U, you'll certainly see word vectors and transformers again, but the emphasis is on doing a lot more with natural language understanding tasks. And so that includes things like building semantic parsers. So they're the kind of devices that um, will, you know, respond to questions and commands such as an Alexa or Google Assistant will do. Um, building relation extraction systems, which get out particular facts out of a piece of text of, oh, this person took on this position at this company. Um, looking at grounded language learning and grounded language understanding where you're not only using um, the language but the world context to get uh, information um, and other tasks that sort. I mean, I guess you can look at the website to get more details of it. I mean, you know, relevant to this class, I mean, a lot of people also find it an opportunity to just get further in doing a uh, project um, in the area of natural language processing that sort of by the nature of the structure of the class, since, you know, it more assumes that people know how to build deep learning natural language systems at the beginning, that rather than um, a large percentage of the class going into, okay, you have to do all of these assignments, although there are little assignments earlier on that there's sort of more time to work on a project for the quarter. Okay, here's one more question that maybe Shakar could do. Do you know of attempts to crowdsource dynamic benchmarks, e.g. users uploading ad adversarial examples for evaluation or online learning? Yeah, so actually, like, uh, the main idea there is to use crowdsourcing, right? So, in fact, there is this bench, uh, so there is this um, platform that was created by Fair, it's called DynaBench. And the objective is just that, that uh, to construct this like dynamically evolving uh, benchmark, we are just gonna offload it to you know, users of this platform. And you can, you know, it essentially gives you utilities for like uh, deploying your model and then having uh, you know, humans kind of try to fool the model. Um, yeah, so, so this is like, it's, it's basically, how the dynamic evaluate uh, the dynamic benchmark uh, 
uh, collection actually works. So like you uh, deploy a model um, on some platform and then you get humans to like fool the system. Here's a question. Can you address the problems of NLP models not able to remember really long contexts and techniques to infer on really large input length? Yeah, so, so I guess like there have been like a few works recently, right? So, that kind of try to scale up transformers to like really large uh, context lengths. Uh, one of them is like the reformer. Um, and there's also like the transformer Excel that was, I think, one of the first ones to try and do that. Um, I think what is unclear is whether you can combine that with the scale of these GPT-like models. And if you see like qualitatively different things, once you do that, like, um, and part of it is just that all of this is just like so recent, right? Uh, but yeah, I think the open question there is that you know, can you take these like really long context transformers that can operate over long context, combine that with scale of GPT-3 and then get models that can actually reason over these like really large contexts. Um, because I, I guess the hypothesis of scale is that once you train language models on uh, at scale, it can start to do these things. And so to do that for long context, we actually need to like, you know, have long context transformers that are trained at scale. And I, I don't think people have done that yet. Uh, so I'm seeing this other question about language acquisition. Chris, do you have some thoughts on this? Or maybe I can just say something like that. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, what do you think we can learn from baby language acquisition? Can we build a language model in a more interactive way like reinforcement learning? Do you know any of these attempts? Uh, oh, that's, that's a big, huge question. And you know, I think the, the short non-helpful answer is that there are kind of no answers at the moment. You know, people have certainly tried to do things at various scales, but you know, we just have, no technology that is the least bit convincing um, for being able to replicate the language learning ability of a human child. Um, but after that prologue, what I could say is, I mean, yeah, there are definitely ideas to have in your head. So, you know, there are sort of clear results, which is that, um, little kids don't learn by watching videos. So it seems like interaction is completely key. Um, little kids don't learn from language alone. They're in a very rich environment where people are sort of both learning stuff from the environment in general. And in particular, you know, they're learning a lot from what language acquisition um, researchers refer to as attention, which is different to what we mean by attention, but it means that the caregiver will be looking at the object that's the focus of interest and, you know, commonly other things as well, like sort of, you know, picking it up and bringing it near the kid and all those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, babies and young kids get to experiment a lot, right? So regardless of whether it's learning what happens when you have um, some blocks that you stack up and play with them or your learning language, you sort of experiment by trying some things and um, see what kind of response you get. And again, that's essentially building on the interactivity of it, that you're getting some kind of response to any utterance you make. And, you know, this is something that's sort of been hotly debated in the language acquisition literature. So a traditional Chomskyan position uh, is that, you know, human beings don't get effective feedback, you know, supervised labels when they talk. 
And, you know, in some very narrow sense, well, that's true, right? It's just not the case that after a baby tries to say something that they get feedback of, you know, syntax error in English on word four, um, or they get um, given, here's the semantic form I took away from your utterance. But in a more indirect way, they clearly get enormous feedback. They can see what kind of response um, they get from their caregiver at every um, corner. And so like in your question, um, you were suggesting that, well, somehow we should be um, making use of reinforcement learning because we have something like a reward signal there. Um, and, you know, in a big picture way, I'd say, oh yeah, I agree. Um, in terms of a much more specific way as to, well, how can we possibly get that to work to learn something with the richness of human language? I, you know, I think we don't have much idea, but you know, there has started to be some work. So people have been sort of building um, virtual environments, which, you know, you have your, um, avatar in and it can manipulate in the virtual environment and there's linguistic input and it can succeed in getting rewards for sort of doing a command where the command can be something like, you know, pick up the orange block or something like that. Um, and, you know, to a small extent, people have been able to build things that work. I mean, as I, as you might be picking up, I mean, I guess, so far, at least, I've just been kind of underwhelmed because it seems like the complexity of what people have achieved um, is sort of, you know, just so primitive compared to the full complex complexity of language, right? You know, the kind of languages that people have been able to get systems to learn are ones that can, yeah, do pick up commands where they can learn, you know, blue cube versus um, orange sphere and that's sort of about how far people have gotten and that's sort of such a teeny small corner of what's involved in learning a human language. One thing I'll just add to that is uh, I, I think there are some principles of uh, how kids learn that people have tried to apply to deep learning and one example that comes to mind is curriculum learning. Um, where there's like a lot of literature that shows that, you know, babies, uh, they tend to pay attention to things that they just, that is just slightly challenging for them. And they don't pay attention to things that are extremely challenging and also don't pay attention to things that they know how to solve. And many researchers have really tried to get curriculum learning to work. Um, and the verdict uh, on that is that it seems to kind of work when you're in like reinforcement learning settings, but it's unclear if it's going to work on like supervised learning settings. But I still think that it's like underexplored and maybe, you know, there should, there should be like more attempts to kind of see if we can like add in curriculum learning and if that improves anything. Yeah. I agree curriculum learning is an important idea which we haven't really talked about, but it seems like it's certainly essential to human learning. Um, and there's been some minor successes with it in the machine learning world, but it sort of seems like it's an idea you should be able to do a lot more with in the future as you move from um, models that are just doing one narrow task to trying to do a more general language acquisition um, process. Um, should I attempt the next question as well? Okay, the next question is, is the reason humans learn languages better just because we are pre-trained over millions of years of physics simulation? Maybe we should um, pre-train a model the same way. So, I mean, I presume what you're saying is physics simulation. Um, you're evoking evolution when you're talking about millions of years. So, you know, this is a, a controversial, debated, big question. Um, so, you know, again, if I invoke Chomsky again, so Noam Chomsky is sort of the um, most famous um, linguist in the world. Um, and, you know, essentially Noam Chomsky's career starting in the 1950s is built around the idea that um, little children get such um, dubious 
linguistic input because you know they hear a random bunch of stuff they don't get much feedback on what they say etc that language could not be learned empirically just from the data observed and the only um, possible assumption to work from is significant parts of human language um, are innate are in the sort of human genome, babies are born with that, and that explains the miracle by which very little humans um, learn amazingly fast how human languages work. Um, now, to speak in credit for that idea, for those of you who have not been around um, little children, I mean, I, th I think one does just have to acknowledge, you know, human language acquisition by live little kids. I mean, it does just seem to be miraculous, right? That you go through this sort of slow phase for a couple of years where, you know, the, the kids sort of goos and gars some syllables. And then there's a fairly long period where they picked up a few words and they can say juice, juice, um, when they want to drink some juice and nothing else. And then it just sort of seems like there's this phase change where the kids suddenly realize, wait, this is a productive generative sentence system. I can say whole sentences. And then in an incredibly short period, they sort of seem to transition from saying one and two word utterances to suddenly they can say, you know, daddy come home in garage, um, putting bike in garage. And you go, wow, how did they suddenly discover language? Um, so, you know, the, so it is kind of amazing. But um, personally, for me, at least, you know, I've just never believed the strong versions of the hypothesis that human beings have much in the way of language specific knowledge or structure in their brains that comes from genetic inheritance. Like clearly humans do have these very clever brains. And if we're at the level of saying, being able to think or being able to interpret the visual world, um, that's things that have developed over tens of millions of years and um, evolution can be a large part of the explanation and humans are clearly born with lots of vision specific hardware in their brains as are a lot of other creatures. But when you come to language, you know, no one, no one knows when language was in a sort of a modern like form first became available because you know, there aren't any fossils of people saying, you know, the word um, spear or something like that. But, you know, to the extent that there are estimates based on sort of what you can see of the sort of spread of um, proto-humans and um, their sort of apparent social structures from sort of what you can find in fossils, you know, most people guess that language is at most a million years old. And, you know, that's just too short a time for any significant ev for evolution to sort of build any significant structure inside human brains that's specific to language. So I kind of think that the um, working assumption has to be that sort of there's just about nothing um, specific to language in human brains. And, you know, the most plausible hypothesis, not that I know very much about neuroscience when it comes down to it, is that humans were being able to repurpose hardware that was originally built for other purposes like visual scene interpretation and memory, and that that gave a basis of sort of having all this clever hardware that you could then use for language. So, you know, it's kind of like GPUs were invented for playing computer games and we were able to repurpose that hardware to do deep learning. Okay, we've got a lot of have uh, come out at the end. Okay, so this one was answered live. Um, Let's see. Yeah, if you could name, I guess this is for either of you, one main bottleneck as to um, 
uh, if we could provide feedback efficiently to our systems, like babies are given feedback, what's the bottleneck that remains in uh, trying to have more human-like language acquisition? Um, I mean, I sort of, I can opine on this. I guess. Oh, were, you sorry, were you saying something, Shikhar? Yeah, I was just going to say that I think it's a bit of everything, right? Like, I, I think in terms of models, um, one thing I'll say is that we know that there's more feedback connections and feed forward connections in the brain. Um, and we haven't really figured out a way of kind of, uh, so, you know, of course we had RNNs. Um, you know, which sort of implement like, you know, you can like loop through an RNN and that sort of implements a feedback loop, but we still haven't really figured out how to, you know, use that knowledge that the brain has a lot of feedback connections and then apply that to uh, like practical, practical systems, I think on the modeling and like maybe that's one problem. Uh, there is like, yeah, I think curriculum learning is maybe one of them, but I think the one that's probably going to have most bang for buck is really figuring out how we can move beyond text. And I think there's just like so much of more information that's available that we're just not using. And so I think that's where most of the progress might come from, like figuring out what's the most tractable of going beyond text. Uh, that's just what I think. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, what are some important NLP topics that we have not covered in this class? Should I do that? Um, you know, well, sort of one answer is a lot of the topics that are covered in CS224U because, you know, we do make a bit of an effort to keep them disjoined, though not fully. Um, Right, so there's sort of lots of topics in language understanding that we haven't covered, right? So if you want to make um, a voice assistant like Alexa, Siri, or Google Assistant, well, you need to sort of be able to interface with systems, APIs that can do things like delete your mail or buy you concert tickets. And so you need to be able to convert from language into a explicit semantic form that can interact with the systems of the world. And we haven't talked about that at all. Um, so there's lots of language understanding stuff. There's also lots of language generation things. So, you know, effectively for language generation, all we have done is neural language models. They are great. Um, run them and they will generate language. And, you know, in one sense, that's true, right? Like, it's just awesome, the kind of generation you can do um, with things like GPT-2 or 3. Um, but, you know, where that's missing is that's really only giving you the ability to produce um, fluent text where it rabbits often um, produces fluent text that if you actually wanted to have a good natural language generation system, you also have to have higher level planning of what you're um, going to talk about and how you are going to express it, right? So then in most situations in natural language, you think, okay, well, I want to explain to people um, something about why it's important to do math classes at college. Let me think how to organize this. Maybe I should talk about some of the different applications where math turns up and how it's a really good grounding, you know, whatever you kind of plan out, here's how I can present some ideas, right? And that kind of natural language generation, um, we're not doing um, any, we haven't done any of, um, yeah, I, so that's sort of saying more understanding, more generation, which is most of NLP, you could say, I mean, obviously there are then sort of particular tasks that we can talk about that we either have or have not explicitly addressed, um, 
Okay. Um, is there, has there been any work in putting language models into an environment in which they can communicate to achieve a task? And do you think this would help uh, with unsupervised learning? So I guess there's been a lot of work on emergent communication um, and also self-play where you have like these uh, different um, models which are initialized as language models that attempt to communicate with each other to solve some task. And then you, know, you have a reward at the end, um, whether they were able to finish the task or not. And then based on that reward, you attempt to learn like a communication strategy. And this started out as like emergent communication and self-play. And then there was like recent work, I think it was like ITL last year or the year before that, where they showed that if you initialize these models with like, uh, with, with like language model pre-training, you um, basically to prevent this problem of like language drift, where you, uh, the language that, or the communication protocol that your models end up learning has nothing to do with like actual language. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, from that sense, there has been some work, um, but it's like very limited. I think there's like some groups that try to study this, but not beyond that. Okay, I mean, the last two questions are about genes. As well as one question about whether genes may some correlations from social cues or reward-based system. I don't know if either of you have opinions about this, uh, but if you do. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything very deep to say about this question. So it's on the importance of social cues as opposed to pure reward-based systems. Well, I mean, in some sense, a social cue, you could also regard as a reward that people you know, like to um, have other people put a smile on their face when you say something. Um, but, you know, I do think generally, um, you know, when people are saying, what have we not covered? Another thing that we've barely covered is the social side of language. So, you know, a huge, a huge interesting thing about language is it has this very dynamic big dynamic range. So on the one hand, you can talk about very precise things in language. So you can sort of talk about math formulas and steps in a proof and things like that, so that there's a lot of precision in language. But, you know, on the other hand, you can just sort of um, phatically mumble, mumble whatever words at all, and you're not really sort of communicating anything in the way of a propositional content, um, what you're really trying to communicate is, you know, I'm, oh, I'm thinking about you right now and, oh, I'm concerned um, with how you're feeling or whatever it is in the circumstances, right? So that a huge part of language use is in forms of sort of social communication between human beings. And, you know, that's another big part of actually building um, successful um, natural language systems, right? So if you, you know, if you think negatively about something like the virtual assistants I've been falling back on a lot is, you know, that they have virtually no ability as social language users, right? So we're now training a generation of little kids that what you should do is sort of bark out commands as if you were, you know, serving in the German army in World War II or something. And um, that there's none of the kind of social part of how to, you know, use language um, to communicate um, satisfactorily with human beings and to maintain a social system. And that, you know, that's a huge part of human language use that kids have to learn. And learn to use successfully right you know a lot of being successful in the world is you know you know when you want someone to do something for you you know that there are good ways to ask them for it you know some of its choice of how to present the arguments but you know some of it is by building social rapport and asking nicely and reasonably and making it 
seem like you're a sweet person that other people should do something for. And, you know, human beings are very good at that. And being good at that is a really important skill for being able to navigate the world well.